So I think we're ready to uh, to start. We've got 33 attendees and no doubt others will begin um, coming in as, as soon as possible. My name's Jen Lilburn. Good evening. I am an independent facilitator. I'm based in Geelong in Wadawurrung country. Um, and my role tonight is to help drive this crazy train of um, online conferencing with about six presenters and four videos and 25 PowerPoint slides. Um, if you see me tearing my hair out, um, luckily I'm already grey, um, it uh, is because of some technical difficulty. Please um, ex exercise some patience tonight um, with this program. It is a bit clunky at times. I'm going to pass over to Steve to, to formally welcome us. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Uh, look, I'll just quickly introduce myself as well. So my name's Stephen Adamthwaite. I'm the Manager of Development Assessments Unit within EPA Victoria, uh, based in the Melbourne office. So I just want to start off by doing an acknowledgement of country. The application that's under consideration tonight is within the lands of the Eastern Ma people. And I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners of that land. I'm also currently standing on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. And I'd also like to acknowledge them as traditional owners of this land. Uh, I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be online today. Can we go to, yeah, thanks, Jen. So I guess just to confirm the purpose of tonight for all the community members and, and thank you for everyone that's uh, able to join us for tonight's proceedings. So the purpose is essentially uh, three different purposes uh, all together. So firstly, it's an opportunity for the EPA staff and, and indeed the applicant one and water to listen and gain a better understanding of community concerns and issues that, that the community feel need to be considered within our assessment of this application. Uh, secondly, it'll help to explain the works approval application process and EPA's assessment process and what the status of this application actually is. And thirdly, it, it should help uh, us greatly to get an understanding of whether there's already ideas out there about potential resolutions for some of the issues that have been raised in submissions or indeed issues that the community have in general. So I really want to emphasise that third one as being a key part of tonight that we're interested in uh, getting towards solutions if, if people have those in mind already. Great, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, and we will be uh, coming back to you later on. In line with that purpose, we do have um, a couple of objectives tonight, which are essentially what, what Stephen has already said, understanding better views. And this, I, I would also like to say that the, um, the ideas and options for possible um, conditions that the EPA could include if it grants the works for approval. It, it's it's a great and powerful position that the community has in, in suggesting those. It's not my role tonight to recommend approval of this project or otherwise. Um, my role is um, to, after tonight, to document your concerns and your suggestions and make recommendations to the EPA if the proposal is approved. Um, the EPA will use my report. Um, they'll use all of that feedback in the submissions that it received um, and the advice of other experts uh, in making their decisions. So tonight, um, well, we'll just talk a little bit around um, how we can make sure that tonight is as productive and successful as possible. I'll introduce who the speakers will be. Um, we'll get a, a quick background to the proposal um, and also an overview of the works approval process. Um, that is just to bring everybody up to the same speed and the same level. There'll be people who have joined us tonight. There are 44 people now online. Um, there'll be people who've joined us tonight who who don't who aren't quite across those things and it, it will just help to inform their contribution tonight. Um, Dave Robinson from the EPA will go through the 
an, a summary of the submissions. Uh, and then those two areas that are in blue there, they are the key, um, the key point, I suppose, of tonight. It's understanding your concerns and perspectives. You've already given us a lot through the submissions and through the online forum. Um, tonight is about getting anything additional, uh, anything that has been missed and um, enabling the um, uh, proponent, one and water to respond to the the uh, concerns that have been raised so far and we'll go through the the themes uh the submission themes um also and just you know tease out anything further so tonight um I'm, uh, those people who joined early will know that we will be using the q a function so the um, that can be found on your screen. It's like two little chat boxes with a question mark in it. If it hasn't popped up, um, sometimes it pops up automatically. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's on the right hand side of your screen. Sometimes it's along the bottom. So um, that is how you contribute to the conference. And um, as I said before, for those people who are here, that will be moderated. So comments go into a, um, a little holding pattern until um, they make it through the filter. We want to capture the diversity and range of views tonight. And, and to do that, we want to ensure that we get a, as broad a, a, uh, a list of options, as broad questions as possible. So I'll, I'll ask you to keep your eye on the Q&A stream as well. And rather than repeat something that somebody else has already said, if you just like it, you know, with the little thumbs up, um, that helps us understand the level of um, interest in that issue or in that question. Um, so if you can keep your, your questions short, I'm going to be going between you know, pressing buttons, looking at the Q&A stream, um, teeing up speakers and so on. Um, and it, it, it does help a lot if questions are, are brief and, and comments are brief. One of the great things about this program is that you can press um, pause if you want to leave the room for whatever reason. Um, you can just press pause and come back and, and um, pick up where you left off. Likewise, this will be recorded at the end of the um, the session. If you have hearing difficulties um, or your speakers are not great, um, right up the top of the Q&A stream, uh, Lauren put in um, a, a link that you can press and that will take you to, to some captions. So um, that will help, hopefully, um, the accessibility of what we're doing tonight. Um, and you may already have noticed that there is a bit of a delay. There can be up to 30 second delay between what uh, we're saying and it going all the way down to, to Warrnambool. Um, so if you could, once again, please be patient. Um, please be patient also with the transitions. And you might get a screen that pops up saying that we there's been a, a slight uh, interruption. That's just because I'm going between different speakers and presentations it will come back um, I promise if you have um, if you feel like it feels like your system has completely frozen um, and you're not getting anything I'd suggest that you leave and come back in um, that usually writes any any issues like that so who have we got on um, tonight presenting? and answering questions. You've already met Stephen. Um, he's the Manager of Development Assessments. David Robinson, you'll meet shortly. He's the Project Officer for Development Assessments. He's the person who is, um, I suppose, on the on the ground person uh, in the nuts and bolts of the application. And Cal Carolyn Francis is here also. She's a Regional Manager of Southwest Region. Um, if there are any specific questions relating to um, operations. Um, in terms of the proponents, uh, the One and Water has provided um, pre-recorded videos for tonight. Um, 
but nonetheless, Andrew, sorry, Andrew, Mark and Chris are here to answer questions and, and very keen to get good, accurate information um, out in the community. Um, those of you who haven't also uh, already done so, if you could add your name, your first name, your town and the traditional owner countries, if you know what it is, and if it's not Gunditjmara, um, which is the the country for Warn the Warrnambool area, um, if you can add that to the Q and A, uh, and it has been pointed out also that um, while you had to sign in as anonymous, you can put your first name or or some um, other name, <laughs> some nom de plume, in the uh, question and answer um, feed. And you've already met me and believe me, by the time we're all said and done tonight, you will be very keen uh, to stop hearing from me. So let's get right into it and um, have a look at the background to the proposal. I'll just bring up the first of our uh, four videos that we're looking at tonight. G'day, I'm Andrew Jeffers, Managing Director of One and Water. Thank you for taking the time today to listen to our proposal for a significant upgrade to the Warrnambool Sewage Treatment Plant. The existing Warrnambool Sewage Treatment Plant was commissioned in 1996, and it's located on coastland just west of Warrnambool's Thunder Point. The plant provides essential services to residential properties across Croydon, Warrnambool and Allensford, as well as many of the local businesses and agencies that drive the economy of our region. This includes public health, education, commercial and retail, all of whom rely on our ability to treat their waste to ensure our region can flourish. The plant also receives and treats trade waste from our major local industries. Each of them have waste treatment facilities of their own. However, some treatment makes more sense to do in a combined plant. An example of this might be combining carbon rich waste with nutrient rich waste to enable the treatment of both to a high standard. Once the sewage and trade waste is treated to the required standard, the water is returned to the environment via an ocean outfall under license conditions enforced by the EPA. So the question is, why do we need to upgrade the Warrnambool Sewage Treatment Plant? The first part of the answer is that the plant has reached its original design capacity. That means it's getting harder to maintain the high standards of treatment that's required. We absolutely acknowledge that there have been incident at the plant in the last few years which have not met the expectations of some in our community or the EPA, or indeed our own expectations of environmental performance. The reality is the plant wasn't designed for an event like Myrtle's. It also doesn't have the resilience that comes from having spare capacity. The second part of the answer is, we need to cater for future growth in our region. Residential growth is occurring, commercial growth is occurring, and growth and change in our major industries is also occurring. By catering for growth now, we're providing an essential infrastructure for future prosperity of our region, and we're keen to see our region flourish. There are four components of what we're proposing, and they represent a significant upgrade in the capacity, the technology, the resilience, and future improvement of the plant. The first part of the upgrade is a complete redesign and replacement of the entire front end of the plant. This is where the initial screening of sewage, trade waste, and septic waste occurs. The current infrastructure is now outdated, and the working environment for our staff is pretty horrible. It's gonna be replaced with a new septage receival facility, more effective screening technology, including dual band screens to ensure there's always one available, and a new odor control facility, which doesn't exist at the plant currently. The second part of the upgrade is an investment in both technology and the capacity for screening at the back end of the plant. And we will use one millimeter automated screens that are quite unique for Australian treatment plants. This is new technology that deals directly with concerns about nurdles, cotton bud sticks, fat balls, and various other marine debris that's being found on our local beaches. The new screens will provide a very robust system to make sure that the material is not coming from Warnable's treatment plant. The first stage of this upgrade has just been completed at a cost of around $1 million, and this will be duplicated as part of the upgrade. A third part of the upgrade is an increased capacity by 50% and an improvement in that technology over what's at the existing plant. Whilst it uses the same basic treatment approach, new features such as carbon dosing 
will make the plant much more resilient. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the design provides tremendous flexibility for further upgrades in coming years. This enables us to consider increases in capacity, further treatment capability for nutrient removal, disinfection or emerging contaminants. For example, the plant has been designed to accommodate future introduction of membrane bioreactors within the existing tanks, providing flexibility to add that form of tertiary treatment if it's appropriate. What we do know is it's important that all customers have a say on those future upgrade options. That's why we're going to engage with all our customers in the lead up to our 2023-28 pricing submission to understand exactly what they would like us to do. Some people will ask, how is the plant funded? And while it's been funded by all our customers, it is based on user pays principles. So each customer segment will pay according to how much of the plant that they actually utilise. This way, large customers will pay a large contribution to the plant and small customers like um, mum and dads and residents pay a small contribution towards the plant. This upgrade is really important for our economy and it's important for our environment. It will allow growth in our region and this project has been designed in a way to ensure that we will maintain and meet EPA license standards into the future. Um, we will go through to the summary of the works approval process. We are getting um, a number of questions that are coming through and, and after the works approval process, we will go to questions that um, are relevant uh, to the process and then we'll get into um, questions that are relevant to the issues and I do apologise one and water reps I'm not sure how that happened. Okay thank you so yeah I'll, I'll quickly talk about the works approval assessment process I'll try and be fairly quick on this section because there is a lot of material about EPA's assessment process available in other forums such as uh, EPA's website or the Engage Vic website. So just to confirm, there's some basic steps of the, the full process. Obviously, we receive an application, deem it to be uh, full enough of information to start our assessment process. Uh, that leads to advertising of the application and referrals to any relevant agencies. Uh, in this case, we've decided to hold a 20B conference to essentially dig into some of the, the submissions for the application with the community, try and get that you know, direct connection with the community, I suppose, to make sure that we understand their concerns and, and really flesh out any of the issues that they, that they might have. Following tonight, then we'll essentially continue with our assessment of the application which will consider outcomes from tonight, but also internal EPA technical assessment, as well as uh, anything that, that we get from our referral agencies. Obviously, that then leads to a decision to, as to whether to approve or refuse the proposal. And, and at, at that point, if people are uh, unhappy with that decision, there are appeal rights for all parties, uh, which would occur through BCAP. So just, Sorry, yep, that's the one. Thanks, Jen. So the one specific uh, part of the process that I wanted to highlight, because it does at times cause a little bit of confusion, is uh, EPA has the power at any point in this process to formally request further information from the applicant. Uh, we call that a Section 22 notice, as that refers to the part of the Act which enables this activity. So the reason why this is important is because it can affect the decision deadlines. So it's common occurrence after a 20B conference like we're in tonight for EPA to want further information from the applicant. When we do that, it essentially stops the clock on the decision while we're awaiting that further information. And once we've received the information and we've determined that it's acceptable given what we were after, then that information will be made publicly available and, and possibly open for comment again, and the clock then will restart on our statutory timelines for our decision. So just to confirm, I guess next step, so we'll finish gathering information in order to inform our assessment. Obviously tonight and the report that follows tonight are, are a key input into our assessment process. Um, as well as our internal technical assessment. 
and any ref any input we get from referral agencies. When when we're coming towards finalising our assessment, essentially the assessment assessment will be uh, is the proposal compliant against legislation, which includes regulations or policies and possibly even guidance. Uh, we'll have an analysis of the key risks and issues that are uh, relevant to the proposal. That'll look at what what types of pollutants or hazards might might occur because of the proposal that's on the table. And we'll also look at best practice of the proposal. So is the technology or equipment or methods being proposed actually best practice? Following all of that, obviously, we'll be ready to make a decision. Uh, when that occurs, if you've been a submitter at any stage in this process, then you will receive a notification that the decision has been made. And that will provide links to uh, where you can see the publication of the decision, including the assessment report, which essentially will explain the reasoning behind whatever the decision was. Back to you, I think, Jen. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, before we go any further, um, I'm keen to see whether um, we now have 55 people on um, on board, which is fantastic. I'm keen to see if people have any questions about the works approval and the application process. And I see there's already one that has come up from um, Alex, which is um, whether the proposal will be subject to scientific peer review. So, Andrew, are you the best person to answer that question? Um, well, probably, I think Stephen is, we've put the assessment works approval application forward with studies that support the uh, application and then the EPA does a an assessment of that. So I'll probably throw that question back to Stephen okay. about what sort of review they do as part of their assessment. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I, I, I didn't quite catch all of the start of your point there, Jen, but I think I got the gist that there's been um, some... It's whether the Sorry, whether the proposal will be subject to scientific peer review was a question that's come up. Okay, great. Yeah, so our, our assessment process, we have internal experts that assist uh, my unit with our assessment. So that will be the first step. So we'll use some in-house expertise uh, on this particular matter to help decide whether we think the proposal uh, is acceptable or not. At times we do go to a third party expertise to support our assessment making. Uh, we don't do that in, ev in every case, but it'll, it'll depend on what expertise we think is relevant to providing assist assistance to our assessment. And I think that that covers off another question that's about the process, um, which was um, whether EPA would consider a scientific review of the report. So I think that you've, you've covered that one off as well. Um, and I'm just going down through the Q&A to make sure that there aren't any other questions relating to the process before we get into the issues. There's a lot of questions that have come through from the issues, but it looks like that is it. Thanks very much, Stephen. So back to me. Um, I uh, we have not shown the one on water five minute video. It was just a con uh, condensed version of that which was on Engage Victoria. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, people will have seen that. Andrew, can you give me a nod whether that is okay or would you prefer that that video be shown? Uh, Jen, you actually did play the five minute video first and then it went into the second video. So oh, it just it, it, it did actually happen. So um, right, okay. I think that's quite, that's that's fine then. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so over to you now, David. Um, you've done some work in summarising the community submissions and you also um put some of that information up online i'd just like to go through you pre-recorded also and i think it's a really great idea that that the pre-records have happened it makes it ensures that your your uh, presentation is nice and tight and covers all of the key 
aspects, but David will be here to answer any questions. Good evening. My name's David Robinson, and um, I work in the Development and Assessments Unit of the EPA, and I'm the Assessing Officer for One and Water's Works Approval Application. I'll just put up some slides now. Um, you can find a detailed summary on the Engage Vic website uh, for now. I would just like to quickly give an overview of the main points raised in the submissions. Um, we'd like to thank all submitters for the time and effort they put into putting the submissions together and I'd like you to know that EPA greatly values input from the local community as we consider that the local knowledge can provide many valuable insights. The main areas of concern, there were um, 83 submissions in all. When going through the submissions, many points were made by the submitters. These are scored uh, by number of mentions, and I then somewhat arbitrarily grouped the responses into five main areas of concern with the application. Most of the responses, understandably, were concerned with the first three above, with a relatively smaller number concerned with um, points D and E. Uh, by far, most of the submitters were concerned with um, risks to human health, um, that is risks to beachgoers, swimmers, divers, and on the and with impacts on the marine environment. They mentioned such things as dirty decants, that is discharges of smelly brown water, and uh, also uh, a great many made the point about the proximity of the discharge to marine reserves and the generally high value of the coastline in the vicinity of the discharge. The concerns with the treatment system and the process itself, um, many pointed out that they didn't consider the outfall as best practice. What they considered best practice was um, reuse of the effluent rather than discharge. Uh, many also mentioned that there was no backup system for when the plant failed and um, also a great many were of the opinion that trade waste customers should contribute more to the cost of the upgrade or the trade waste should be treated at its source. Um, concerns with the discharge quality. Main concerns uh, by the numbers was that the proposal seemed to be more about adding volumetric capacity with no improvement to quality and concerns about the quality of the wastewater such as microplastics and the very high levels of phosphorus in the discharge. Um, concerns with the uh, works approval process itself. Um, there was a um, number of submitters expressed a lack of trust in one and water and EPA as the regulator. And finally, um, uh, uh, there were concerns expressed about the location of the plant and the discharge point itself, and many pointed out that it was adjacent to a marine park, and um, uh, some thought that um, the plant itself was too close to residential areas. Um, uh, thank you, and if you think I've missed some key points in the summary, please speak up. Well done, Dave. Thanks very much for that. I'll just bring us back to our um, summary here. We're getting a lot of questions through, which is fantastic. We'll look to um, address those. But there was a question that was just related to community engagement. Oh, I see Chris Marnie, you have already uh, responded to that one. Thank you. I think that it would be um, really helpful if any questions can be answered by any of the presenters through the, the question and answer. Um, if you could keep doing so, that would be um, really helpful. Thank you. Um, so the response by One and Water over the last week um, or more, a couple of weeks, you um, community members have been emailing um, or submitting questions and comments. Some of those were answered um, by One and Water online, some were answered by 
um, EPA online and the second video, <laughs> which I've already started um, and I will run back through a little bit, um, was in response to those. So I see there's a question come up, but why wasn't that posted on Engage Victoria? Um, it was actually, um, my understanding was it's only just been finished due to um, the fact that they needed to see all of the questions and responses, um, all of the questions and comments in order to produce a video that responded to those. Um, Andrew, can you verbally uh, let me know if that is the case? Um, well, it was in, in relation, it took a bit of time to respond to all the um, comments and queries which were done in this video. It was also, I believe, part of the process to release that to, today as part of this forum. OK, thank you. Uh, so I will take us back a little bit in that video um, so that we, we um, get back into the content of what you were saying. Um, and that second video was in response, as I say. Thanks to everyone for being part of this conference this evening. I really appreciate the time that you've given to help us with this project. Now I'd like to hand over to some of our team to go through the themes and issues that have been raised. It's important for One and Water to know what impact we are having on our environment. For the Warnable STP, this means we have a comprehensive internal and external monitoring and reporting program in place. For example, operators at the plant complete more than a thousand settling tests a year to monitor the quality of what is released to the ocean. Their daily tests and online monitoring systems are used to highlight any issues and adjust the treatment process to meet our EPA license requirements. We also send away weekly samples for independent analysis at nationally accredited laboratories. And these results are provided to the EPA so they can check our license compliance. We also make this report available to the public through our website. Detailed expert surveys of the marine environment are also done throughout the year. And we have results for more than a decade to help us understand what, if any, impact the plant might have on the marine environment. The EPA also require us to report whenever there is an event that's outside our license parameters, and we have continued to meet this requirement. The EPA also do their own site inspections and from time to time issue notices for additional information on the performance of the plant. So what does that tell us about the plant performance? Is it having an impact on the environment or is it having an impact on public health? The Warrnambool plant has historically recorded 100% compliance with our EPA license, and this demonstrates the reliability of the treatment process that we use. Quite recently, we've had some dirty decants occur, and they are a symptom of the plant reaching capacity. A dirty decant is a carryover of solids, primarily treated material. At no time has the plant discharged raw sewage to the ocean. In terms of public health, we monitor this more often than we're required to, and the results are consistently well below the health limits. Odour complaints from the site are reported under our EPA licence, and there haven't been any for many years now. We're also not aware of any human health impacts resulting from our discharge from the plant. In 2020, results from the detailed marine monitoring program showed that the mixing zone is effective. The consultant concluded that the current outfall arrangement and treated effluent are protecting the beneficial use required under the State Environment Protection Policy. To sum up, there has been incidents at the plant in the last few years, but the core treatment technology we're proposing for the upgrade has a proven track record of EPA license compliance. It does not pose a threat to the marine environment or human health outside of the mixing zone. The upgrade is designed to further improve the performance of the plant and provide greater backup in the event of any short-term failures. This includes replacing and relocating the inlet works. This substantially reduces the possible odour footprint of the plant, increases site security, ensures there's always screening of the incoming waste. Increasing the capacity of the plant provides greater flexibility for operators to retain and retreat waste within the tanks if performance is not okay on any particular day. And dual automated screens with manual backups ensure there is always fine screening for visible microplastics and the like before treated water is discharged to the ocean. The Warrnambool plant produces a lot of greenhouse gases. 
primarily from the use of energy on the site and from the sewage itself. As a business, we're delivering a range of projects to reduce our overall emissions by 40% by 2025. This commitment includes exploring how we can reduce emissions from an existing and upgraded warnable plant. This upgrade is fundamental to support the creation of long-term economic growth in our region, including over 300 direct and 1,000 indirect jobs by 2040. Waste treatment involves everyone in a city. The Warrnambool plant does not just accept whatever people throw at it, and we're active in reducing waste at the source. Our major customers each have their own treatment plants, and we have limits in place for what they can discharge to us. We're continuing to work with them to plan for the future, but we do breach them if expectations are not being met. We're also working with the community through initiatives such as the Be Clever, Never Ever campaign. We also lead the establishment of the Clean Oceans Collective to develop source reduction plans for marine plastics and other waste found on our beaches. We're very aware of the significant global R&D still occurring into what impacts microplastics may have and what contribution is coming from sewage treatment plants. Obviously, reducing at the source, not at the treatment plant at the end of the pipe, is the preferred outcome. The design of the upgrade does help improve discharge quality. For example, it includes alum dosing to better manage phosphorus removal. And it includes better anoxic zones within the tanks and the addition of carbon dosing, both used for the removal of nitrogen. One aspect that might not be well understood is that nutrient removal can lead to increased solids being produced at the sewage treatment plant, which then need to be transported away from the treatment plant and disposed of to land. We appreciate that the Clean Ocean Foundation has been recommending Class A for all outfalls. Going to Class A would add another 30 million on top of the 40 million we're already proposing. A number of submissions have suggested that the outfall be closed completely. Uh, to be clear, the works approval process we're seeking is for additional capacity and quality needs going forward, not whether the existing plant should stay where it is. We did look at whether the upgrade could be done inland in a few different ways. It would require very major changes to the way the sewage system operates. It would literally mean we'd have to uh, work against gravity and literally push <coughs> uphill. It would also need a large new site that wouldn't impact on neighboring land and extra infrastructure to produce recycled water with a low salt content. You'd also have to build very large storage dams to hold treated water during the wetter months, and you'd need a large irrigation area to suitably dispose of the water. And you'd be competing against the cost of groundwater that farmers already have access to. Overall, the inland options had higher costs and higher impacts than the option we're proposing, and we don't consider those to be viable at the moment. We are committed to continue to investigate opportunities for reuse applications and additional treatment in the future. The upgrade is a necessary project irrespective of any future decisions regarding class A treatment or other tertiary treatment processes. We appreciate that even though it's well known that there's an outfall, some people still choose to fish and swim very close by. There are signs indicating it is not a suitable place for swimming or fishing, and we've raised the issue of people's behaviours to the EPA. It's ironic that it has a reputation for producing great fishing and diving. Disinfection prior to discharge was considered in the design process. Wayne's shown the data confirming our current performance is well within the health guidelines, and further treatment is not required under our EPA licence. Wayne previously talked about upgrades in the event of system or plant failures, but I'd like to emphasize additional elements like backup power on site and the extra redundancy in pumps and chemical dosing systems that we're adding. It's not in our interest to have the plant fail and avoiding this is built into the design. Overall, we looked at the very broad range of options for this upgrade, and I'm confident that the concerns and the options raised by the community as part of this process have already been considered in our design. We're thankful for the stakeholder reference group for setting the weightings that we use to compare the options. The environment was weighted the highest at 40%. Many of the items in this theme have already been covered in our overview video and in the information presented by Wayne and Simon. 
We pride ourselves on not only listening to our communities, but incorporating the feedback we receive from them into our plans. This can often be a balancing act as there are many different yet very valid perspectives in our community. This project is no different. Andrew has already spoken about the stakeholder reference group and that year we also conducted a drop-in session, multiple mailbox drops and a series of stakeholder conversations. Given what we heard through the Nurdles incident, last year we did a further community engagement to produce the screening strategy for this project. There's been a dedicated project page on our website throughout this project's development and we've produced three community newsletters in the past 12 months. We do this because we know our customers really value information. We know there's a strong interest in this project, so we're committed to continuing to communicate over the next few years while it's being built. We're proud that in the past several years, our customer base as a whole has indicated increasing levels of trust in our organisation, particularly in a backdrop of a society where trust of government and institutions can be low. However, in the submissions on our work's approval for this project, it is clear to us that a lack of trust has been expressed by many. As officers of Wanham Water, but also as fellow community members of South West Victoria who love our place, we take this really seriously. Our hope is that tonight, the information provided gives you greater confidence that our proposed upgrade has considered many of the questions you've been concerned about. Thanks, Kelly Wainsong. In summing up, I'd like to repeat that I believe this project does address the need to protect our environment. And I see that it reduces environmental risk through the various upgrades that are included. It also provides for future growth of our region and is based on proven technology and a very thorough design process. We don't believe it's the right time to move to tertiary treatment. Our customers haven't given us the license for their cost to be increased to do so. EPA licenses are designed to protect the environment. The upgrade that we are proposing is designed to achieve 100% compliance with the EPA licence. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Juan and Water. And uh, it was an impossible as it turned out to, to just go back a little bit. It, the uh, system in, insisted on going back to the start. So anyway, there, you, there we have it. Um, now on to some community perspectives. There are a lot of questions rolling in, um, which we will um, answer as we go through. Um, and Mark and Chris, I'd ask you if you can just keep an eye on those questions too and make sure that they're answered um, completely. Um, community perspectives. We've heard a lot about uh, One and Water's perspectives and um, their rationale for this proposal. Uh, and it, it, it seems only right and just to give the community um, the same platform. So um, I'm going to show a video that was um, created by 12 people, a collaboration of 12 community members. Um, not all of them speak during the video. Um, some of them have uh, had their voices trans um, expressed by the narrator and they preferred not to be um, on the video itself. This video was put on the Q&A um, on the Engage Victoria website and um, you may have seen it. It's a, it's a good reminder, I, I will still play it in its entirety and hopefully with sound. <laughs> um, but it gives you a chance to get more of those questions in, um, more of those comments. Um, if the video just reminds you of something that 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 um, you've been meaning to contribute, that's a great way of, of doing that also. So I'll just bring that video up now. This video aims to reflect the wide ranging concerns of the Warnable community. We understand the need for the treatment plant to expand due to residential and commercial growth. However, we expect best practice solutions and the upgrade to mitigate risks to the environment, the public and the future of our coastline. We live in a remarkable place with a stunning coastline of limestone reefs, kelp forests and wild ocean beaches. We are blessed with abundant coastal wildlife such as little penguins, southern right whales and shorebirds of international significance. 
Thunder Point is a magical place for divers and snorkelers to explore the lush seaweed gardens, rocky outcrops and diverse marine life. And for fishers to catch a meal of fish, craze or shellfish. So why would we trash it? The Thunder Point Coastal Park Sewage Ocean Outfall borders the protected Merai Marine Sanctuary. The treated sewage wastewater discharged is far from clean. Plastics such as cotton buds and nurdles have been routinely discharged along with balls of rancid fat. Dirty foam, brown murky water and grey scum washes on the beach. High phosphorus and nutrient concentrations in the wastewater lead to algal blooms, and algae blooms can be toxic to aquatic species and to us. Since 2017, volunteers have recorded 383 occasions of sewage-related pollution at Shelley Beach. More than 40 reports have been made to the EPA when significant gross pollution has occurred. The 98% compliance with the EPA licence reported by One and Water is based on weekly samples and is measured against extremely lenient effluent quality requirements when compared to the vast majority of Australian STPs. Up until November 2019, their licence allowed the discharge of plastics, litter, fats, oils, medications and foams into the marine environment, and recently it is allowing biomass to be discharged. Of note, the load on warnable STP is currently dominated by highly variable trade waste loads. This creates serious challenges in maintaining effective treatment and results in poor environmental outcomes during normal operations and additional process failures which result in these major discharges of pollution failure events. The work's approval proposes to increase these problematic loads without providing the source control or infrastructure required for their proper treatment. This will result in increased pollution to the Thunder Point environment, both within the requested works approval and as a result of process failure events. When One and Water discharged millions of nurdles into the ocean in November 2017, they were actually compliant with their EPA licence. When we reported two major hair and fat ball incidents in October 2018 and again in October 2019, there was no breach of conditions. When One and Water discharged 14 million litres of grey sewage sludge into the ocean in March 2019, this was not a breach of conditions. When they discharged balls of milky white fat a month later, no breach. When we reported raw sewage containing visible corn pieces in August 2019, still no breach. And this year, six documented gross pollution events of unsettled sewage into the ocean did not, according to One and Water's lab results, exceed the discharge limit. No EPA breach. The mere fact that these events were not breaches goes to show just how weak the licence conditions were and still are. And of course, as the Nurdle spill tells us, the pollution from our outfalls spreads along our whole coastline. Why isn't One and Water protecting the environment like they say they are in all their PR? We can do better than this. Our kids deserve to inherit something better than this. Gunnamatta Beach on Melbourne's fringe was plagued with similar problems from a dirty outfall historically. In 2007, the Victorian government committed $412 million to upgrade this outfall to Class A plus using advanced tertiary treatment, making the water safe for all users and suitable for recycling into the future. The proposal by One and Water to dump excessive amounts of poorly treated trade waste via a domestic outfall into our great southern ocean is a stark rejection of the Victorian standards set by the Melbourne Eastern Treatment Plan. If it's good enough for Gunnar, why doesn't South West Victoria matter? In their screening strategy, One and Water had an opportunity to address emerging pollutants such as microfibres and microplastics less than one millimetre, which according to their own research makes up the largest proportion of microplastics in effluent but their $1 million effluent screen does not capture these microplastics. One and Water's current attitude towards polluting plastics in the marine environment is ambiguous. 
In their risks register, they acknowledge that the likelihood of plastics discharging into the ocean with the current controls is highly likely. However, they rate this consequence as low, stating that there is no evidence to suggest that organisms prefer plastic to natural diet. There are issues with plastic when they discharge in the water. They cause a lot of environmental damage that can cascade through ecosystems. The simplest way to look at it is to say, well, do fish eat plastics? Well, yes, they do. Uh, do birds eat plastics? Yes, they do. These things accumulate in their systems. 50% of the fish that have been studied, and this was a study in the last five years, found they had plastic in their intestines. So they're eating something that is stopping them from eating other things. So they are nutrient deprived and they're not healthy fish. So along comes a dolphin or a seal and that eats 10 of those fish. And if each of those fish has one piece of plastic in it, that dolphin or seal now has 10 pieces of plastic in it. These things have long-term consequences. They reduce the fauna out there. They damage the environment. They destroy the things that we love about the ocean. Look, at the end of the day, one and water should be doing tertiary treatment. It shouldn't be anything less than best practice. They know that what they're planning on doing is not best practice. Uh, if they were doing best practice, there would be no plastics. There would be no biological or chemical contaminants going out in the ocean. Move to best practice, eliminate the problem. So what do these pollution events mean for public health? The current mixing zone has a radius of 300 metres. That means 600 metres of coastal park, which is unsafe for recreational use. Inside this mixing zone is the popular Shelly Beach where families go to rock pool, swim and collect shells. The Thunder Point track leads tourists and locals alike directly to this spot for recreation. Why on earth is there a public beach in the middle of a mixing zone? And why aren't public health risks adequately addressed in the work's approval? Secondary treated sewage water is high in pathogens such as bacteria and viruses and therefore pose risks to the public. Keep in mind that the Thunder Point outfall discharges at the water's edge and pollution washes into the rock pools and onto the beach inside and outside the mixing zone. Risks include infections, gastro and even death. One of the little favourite spots I like going to is out to Eagle Rock, Shelly Beach area and uh, even I've just, just come out of the water now and uh, as I was coming out there was another guy with all his dive gear, you know, thinking about going in as well. And then when I got back to the car park here, there's um, another couple of guys who were going in around that area again um, today. So it's a very popular little spot. There is no evidence in the report which analyzes how much use of that area is occurring recreationally, other than a blanket statement saying it's not being used a lot and it's unlikely to be used a lot. Again, that comes with assessing the risk to the community properly by assessing how much use is actually occurring on that beach rather than making a blanket statement without any supporting evidence. Pouring sewage into the ocean threatens our health. It can infect the fish, it can infect the shellfish and us, the humans. There are standards for faecal bacteria around sewage outlets. The laboratory results which I've seen indicate that the levels are 12 times what's permitted. According to the WHO, that means if you swim in this water, you've got a one in 20 chance of becoming ill. It's in the back of my mind. Am I going to get sick from something from here? Even though the EPA, you know, I'm presuming have said that it's safe for people to go there because, um, you know, even today when I was get, getting in the water, there was a guy fishing in that area. And, um, you know, and I see that quite often, people fishing out there in, in that area. So, you know, if people are catching fish there and those fish have got some sort of toxins in them from the outflow, uh, well, then it's going to go into the people. And so I'd like to think that the EPA has got things in place where that's not going to happen. An expansion is planned to double the amount of sewage wastewater discharged into the ocean at Thunder Point to 28 million litres a day. The $40 million expansion does not include better treatment of wastewater, 
but is based on the same technology that has failed us and our fragile marine environment for far too long. The current system, according to specialists in the field, is already decades behind modern practices in wastewater treatment. The proposal looks to double the current approved flow and more than double the current load, that is, a 100% increase. Why is it only proposed to increase the secondary treatment capacity by 50%? This will just result in greater overload. The plant is currently substantially below its design limit in terms of flow, about 14 megalitres per day compared to 16.4 megalitres per day design. However, it is frequently suffering from failures, as evidenced by the routine dry weather discharge of treatment biomass to Thunder Point. Despite this, the proposed works do not include any measures to improve the capacity or performance of the existing secondary treatment process. Unless this is addressed, these performance issues may continue. Warnable STP currently discharges the third highest loads of nitrogen and phosphorus into the ocean in Victoria, after the two Melbourne plants which service more than two million people each. The proposed upgrade will allow these discharges from Warnable STP to more than double current values. This is due to the poor level of treatment proposed, which will generate poorer water quality than the other coastal plants in Victoria, both larger and smaller and much poorer quality than is achieved in all inland Victorian plants and most plants throughout Australia. Acceptance of the proposal would result in a large shift in costs, both financial and environmental, from corporations to Warrnambool's community. While Warrnambool's population is expected to increase to 65 to 70,000 by 2040, the works approval is for the equivalent of wastewater flow from 150,000 people nitrogen loads from 300,000 people and phosphorus loads 900,000 people. As Warrnambool's residents generate sewage loads which are much lower than the capacity of the existing plant and only a small proportion of the future loads, they should not be called on to pay the capital costs of the upgrades proposed. More importantly, they should not be asked to tolerate the additional pollution, the additional risks to human health and the additional environmental impacts which stem from the failure of local industries to adequately treat the wastewater they generate. I asked for a detailed examination of the economic argument which says they don't need to do tertiary treatment on that plant. They haven't done one. They have relied on economic arguments from other treatment facilities where it says this is not economic. Given the amount of expense, the proximity to the town and the proximity to swimming beaches, it beggars belief that they have not done a proper cost-benefit analysis. What is it going to cost the community? What is it going to cost them? They have focused entirely on what their costs are, not on the broader costs to the community over time. And they haven't looked at how the population of Warrnambool will grow. In 20 years or 25 years that I've been here, Warrnambool has grown hugely out the, that direction. There are developments going out that way as well, where the outfall is. So they haven't factored that in. I, I've seen nowhere in that documentation where they've considered this. Just because we've always polluted doesn't mean we should continue to pollute. There are widely used alternatives which will protect our environment and health and enable our community to benefit from the water, energy and nutrients available in our sewage. Treating Thunder Point as a dumping ground for our sewage and wastewater is no longer acceptable. It is time for change. Give Warnable the clean blue backyard it deserves. Help us change history. Demand better sewage treatment for Warnable. Um, I do know that some of the um, comments in that video have been picked up in the uh, video already um, played uh, that was produced by One and Water, but there are a lot of questions that um, still remain uh, in the chat and, and a couple that I think haven't 
quite been answered. So um, I'm going to suggest if you have further questions, continue them coming in um, and we'll work their way through. I know that a lot have been addressed already, but I'm going to go back to 7.10 p.m. There was a um, comment by Mandy Shute who um, asked whether studies have been done on the impact of sewage on the Mer Merai Marine Sanctuary. Um, and I think, Mark, your comment underneath was talking about sampling of the outfall environment and how far that was. But I think the question was more about, um, you know, impacts on the ecology there and, um, and I suppose, longer term impacts. Is there um, somebody who can address that question, please? There we go. I can at least make a start and perhaps just uh, clarify my comment there. So, so that comment related to the uh, Mirai Marine Sanctuary and my response was really just um, talking to the routine outfall monitoring that one and water undertakes um, through a third party and that that expands to roughly about a thousand metres from the uh, outfall discharge point. What I can't confirm is the actual location of the Mirai uh, Marine Sanctuary, but maybe uh, Chris or Andrew can um, elaborate a bit further on what I've said there. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's not just where the sampling has been undertaken. It's more about monitoring impacts over time. Is what I read into that question. Any anybody else able to yeah, comment I've, I've on just, that? At a, at a broad level, Jen, in response to that question, um, there's ecological studies undertaken at the ocean outfall, and you saw in our video the. Um, some of the sampling associated with that and these reports were prepared and those reports were included in the works approval application and um, that's undertaken by a, a specialist consultant and they assess the impacts within the mixing zone of the uh, discharge and what, right. actually, what, what those reports say uh, at a broad level is um, there are minor impacts within the mixing zone but no impacts outside the mixing zone um, right. from those ecological uh, assessments. OK, um, and, I, and I suppose we could have a whole conversation about minor, um, but let's uh, what minor means. But um, if that's in the documentation, uh, we'll leave it there. Um, the next question under that has not been answered. It starts with a it was at 7.16 in the in the Q&A. Um, it talks, there's a comment there about no advantage in combining carbon rich waste with phosphorus rich waste. Um, but then there's a question after it that hasn't yet been addressed. As biological phosphorus removal is not being proposed in the STP upgrade, why not treat the huge phosphorus load, phosphorus load at its source rather than discharging into the environment? Um, who could- I'll throw, I'll throw that one to, to Mark as well, uh, Jen. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. I can at least sort of confirm the, the first point um, there, or, or maybe talk to the first point there, which is around um, carbon dosing. Um, so this, this comment here is talking about no advantage of combining carbon rich waste with phosphorus rich waste. That That is correct because um, there is no biological phosphorus removal other than that that occurs naturally through the uptake of the, the biomass in the treatment plant. Um, but the carbon rich waste is used as part of the nitrogen removal process. So it does have um, benefit in that regard. Um, the second part there is around um, controlling uh, phosphorus at source. And I guess at the moment, Andrew might talk a little bit more around um, source control with trade waste customers, but it does fall under um, the regulation imposed by One and Water. And um, that includes through the, the trade waste um, discharge consents that One and Water has in place with its trade waste customers, which I think maybe Caroline made a point about in response to one of the other questions in the chat too. Andrew, yes. are, you, are you going to pick uh, that up? Yeah, I'll pick that up and, and Mark was writing that. Um, so for phosphorus, the main action there to re re reduce phosphorus is through source reduction. So working um, through where the sources of phosphorus come from and actually reducing it at that source rather than through the treatment plant end. Our trade waste licence 
uh, agreements or trade waste agreements with major customers have limits on phosphorus and we're um, in constant discussion with them about how, they, how um, phosphorus can be further removed um, at the source from those facilities. Okay. Okay, um, the next two that haven't been answered uh, were both at 717 and they relate to plastics. Um, the first is, will the new system be able to treat microplastics as per European best practice? I suppose that's it's really on people's mind um, also after noodles, but, but uh, that's also looking at microplastics. Can you respond to that, please? Yeah, I'll start and, okay. and if Mark or Chris got anything to add, they can add. Um, we did address, we did respond to this question in our response video. So oh, yes. Yes. Um, uh, now I'm not so sure about European standards, but what we do know is microplastics uh, through secondary treatment place processes are removed uh, down to about 80% re removal through the process. And uh, of course, uh, in the video, we mentioned that there's a one millimeter uh, final effluent screen being installed as part of, one has been brought forward and installed on the existing treatment facility in response to the NERDLE. So we responded to new information and we were proposing as part of the upgrade on the two new tanks, there will also be a one millimeter screen on that to screen uh, microplastics down to that size. The issue of microplastics is a broader societal issue and it can't all be solved by just increasing the standards of treatment at the end. And um, uh, so um, our, and in our video, we also pointed to the, the need for our society to reduce the amount of microplastics being produced at a household level and um, into sewage systems and other systems as well. So it, broadly, that's that's our response. This, this um, does make the proposal does put a good step forward in terms of microplastics um, and has a significant improvement over what was there previously. All right, so some, some advocacy also within community you're referring to as well. Um, so the second question I think is about bigger, bigger plastics. Um, and I this was written while your uh, video was playing at 7.17 and if the plastics don't come from the treatment plant, where else can they come from? Um, the plastics that we saw being picked up on the beach in that other in the community video. So Jen, I can respond more more generally, and um, there are plastics that circulate through the ocean um, currents uh, around the world, and that's pretty clear. There are plastics that have been um, uh, picked up off the beach um, close to the ocean outfall. We've had um, a reasonably fine screen at that plant since uh, no, I think it might be December 2017, and um, removing um, um, you know plastics that get through the screen, the inlet screens to the treatment plant. And the quantities we got off that screen in a 10 month period were, were not significant. They certainly didn't represent the amount of plastics that have been um, pulled off the beaches previously. So. We believe that those um, the, the, the sticks and other things that have been picked up on the beach in more recent times are, are, are either, and we honestly don't know, are from historical uh, operation of the ocean outfall and um, the screenings only for, the screening plan only first went in there in 1992. So it's potential that in the um, sand, uh, beach sand there, that there's there's plastics associated from that from history. Um, and or a mixture of plastics coming in on currents as well. So um, that they're, they're possible solutions, uh, um, explanations, and we don't know what the answer is. But what we do know is, is what we're putting forward as a proposal will have a very robust uh, improvement to the inlet screening to the treatment plant and um, new outlet screening to the treatment plant at one millimetre size. So that is a, a, a significant improvement in um, uh, plastics removal than what has historically been the case. Thank you. Um, I, Chris, I see that you're responding to the question at 7.21, so I'll leave that and keep going through the, the stream. Um, there was a- Jen. Yes. Um, 
I noticed there was a question um, back up at um, 719, which also came through in the, the video. I wasn't sure if we haven't um, provided a response to that. I'm just wondering if if we wanted to talk briefly about that one. Oh, I might have missed that one, which was, I, I was just, oh, yes, I did. Sorry, I did miss that one. Thanks for picking it up, Mark. Oh, I only, I only know because I was just about to start typing a response and it was um, after the question that Andrew was addressing. So I thought I would, would jump in. So yeah. so it is it is has been correctly pointed out that the uh, upgrade of the plant makes an allowance for roughly a 100% flow increase and roughly a 50% load or level of contaminant increase in the sewage. And really that stems from the forecasts that were made based on residential growth and growth in industry around the region. It's always important that any time we look at an upgrade project, we think about what are the various scenarios that might play out in future in terms of, as I say, both residential growth, commercial growth, industrial growth. And that leads us to a particular forecast and um, uh, let's say contaminant level within the sewage and that formed the basis for the upgrade. Right, and I think that the, the questions at 727, which I think the second question looks like it's, it's probably Laurie Lawrenson's um, continued. Um, and that is also about um, capacity. Um, and this question is about if the upgrade isn't approved. Um, <laughs> what happens there if if there is if there is no approval of the upgrade? Is that something well, that EPA covers or? or no, I think I, I should respond to that, Jean, and then perhaps the EPA can um, add to that. But I think it's a question for one and water. Um, uh, so if the if if the um, upgrade isn't approved at, at all and the project can't proceed what one and water would have to do so the epa license still remains there would have to um, reduce um, trade waste from industry what they could discharge and that would impact the operation and capacity of their businesses and no doubt would, would, would re result in reduction in jobs and lost opportunity for growth so it has an impact on the cost to the community also um, the uh, ability to build tertiary treatment on top of a secondary treatment plant um, that is beyond capacity is, is not going to work. So what we heard through the community uh, feedback is an interest in tertiary treatment and what that means. Um, we've, you saw in my video, I made a commitment that we will further explore that. So we've responded to that community concern and said we will do all the work and come back and engage with the community about tertiary treatment. However, this you can't do tertiary treatment on top of a secondary treatment plant that's over capacity. So really what we're saying is the project has to proceed in an appropriate format. Um, we believe we've done all the design and work and studies to say that the, the improvements are really robust and strong. Um, and but however, uh, there's no no point in trying to do tertiary treatment without this um, major upgrade to the secondary treatment process. Any comment on that EPA or shall we keep moving? Stephen or David? No, OK. Um, I, I suppose the next question at 7.31 carries on from that um, and that's about inherent issues regarding the modelling. Um, what what happens if there are if the modelling isn't quite right? It doesn't reflect the reality once once the plant is built. Is that that the license is it picks up and then any non-compliance issues? Thanks, Mark. No worries. Yeah, look, it, it, it's a good point. There's probably a couple of um, things to pick up on there, Jen. Um, the first one is around development of the the model itself um, so so obviously work went into that and we were fortunate enough that we could ground truth some of the um, outputs from the model based on current conditions and using all of the uh, sampling and impacts on the environment that have come out from, of the routine monitoring undertaken by one and water to date so that gave us some confidence 
that the model was suitable for um, uh, the current situation, um, if not a little conservative. And then from that, we were able to extrapolate out future scenarios at higher flows. I guess ultimately, the, the requirements of the license and SEP are there to hold everybody accountable. So over time, the ongoing monitoring of the uh, outfall, both in terms of water quality and ecological impacts, will influence future decisions by, um, by, by one and water. Okay, thank you. And I'll, I'll just, um, uh, while you're there also, I'm not sure, Mark, whether it is uh, you, I'm up to 7.38 now. Um, in Leangatha, Saputo had to upgrade its waste treatment and take responsibility for the cost involved. Has this been explored with a thorough cost benefit analysis? Uh, is that you, Mark, or? No, it's probably myself. Uh, yep. Thanks, Jen. Um, th there's a constant circle between one and water and its uh, major trade waste customers. They're really important businesses to our, our region, our economy. Um, uh, of, of, of our region um, and there's a constant circular discussion around where does it best make sense to do the upgrades uh, for quality improvements at the site at their site or our site and and we try to look at what's the what's the best solution overall and move down that path so mentioned before that um, phosphorus is really something that has to be tackled by the customers themselves. It's not something that will, will be significantly impacted through this treatment process. So that's something they dealt with there, uh, where there's other, other parameters. Um, and I do should mention, they do do pre-treatment at all these sites. So what we receive has already been through a treatment process. Um, and so we're constantly doing that debate and discussion and many, many technical reports and studies to work out what's the most effective way of treating the trade waste to a, um, or treating the the whole waste cycle, I guess, in the the, the um, um, most economical, but also the most robust way as well. OK, I'm going to just ask one more question um, before we get into um, additional um, perhaps p uh, concerns and hopefully some options to make the proposal more acceptable and um, attendees um, rest assured as and I saw one of the moderators had made this point as well all the questions are recorded um, if they're not answered tonight they will be answered um, we've just got a we've got a, a short amount of, of time left but I do want to just ask this last question at 752 um, Andrew is one and waters board aware of their responsibility under Victoria's general environmental duty legislation which will be active from July next year in relation to the risks to human health and the environment. Are they aware of their liabilities under this upcoming legislation? Same question. Over to you, Andrew. Uh, the short answer to that question is yes. I love, it. I love a short answer to a question. Thank you very much. I'm going to just uh, get you off the hook for a moment, Andrew. You'll be pleased to know. Um, and keep those comments and questions coming in. Um, I'm going to go through each of the um, themes now and um, it. I know you'll be frustrated that not everything has been answered, but um, presenters, if you can continue to answer the questions, um, uh, continue to go up and down through the chat, uh, through the Q&A function and, and continue to answer the questions. Uh, it looks like there's been 88 so far, although that might include some of the responses as well. Uh, so what we are very keen to know is additional concerns or issues that have not been raised and potential options for resolving um, some of the concerns. Now, some of these options have come through the um, Q&A forum so far um, on Engage Victoria, a small number had, but I'm very keen um, to explore these a little bit further. So, First of all, in terms of discharge impacts, so that includes 
um, you know, impacts on human health, marine environment, amenity, fishing and aquaculture, the local economy, um, and also greenhouse gases. Are there any um, remediating actions that could be um, considered? Are there any options, something to do with the operation of the plant or the design of the facility? Is there anything that that um, you would like explored to ease your concerns if it's approved or in the process of approval um, uh, or the process of determination, I should say, that relate to discharge impacts that could just help in some way from your point of view. If you could send those through the Q&A function, that would be really helpful. Okay. Doesn't look like there's any more coming through. So um, in terms of the treatment system, in terms of the concern about reuse, um, backup systems for plant failure, um, trade waste customers treating their own waste to a higher level, um, other alternatives being explored, uh, disinfection, high salt outputs, um, reusing wetlands and eco forests. There are the sorts of submission um, questions and concerns that came up under treatment system. Can you think of any options, any um, operational measures or any design measures that could be put in place um, to help ease your concern about treatment? Jen, uh, I just noticed there's one there at 828, which um, addresses B. So that's the one related to um, achieve approval, what would encourage them or drive their trade, waste customers to achieve treatment at source. Is that what you're referring to, Andrew? So, well, the yeah, that's right. The suggestion is there. Um, yeah. If it was approved under the current format, what what things could be in place to encourage or require us to investigate tertiary treatment? Oh, I'll just um, look at Laurie's question there. While while I'm at it, um, Andrew, seeing as you sent me to that part of the stream, um, cost benefit analysis document. Have you have you done one for this proposal? Um, I'm not sure what what cost benefit Laurie's referring to. So there are there are lots of different cost benefit um, analyses that, that are and can be done. Um, the the this proposal is put forward on the basis to achieve make sure we achieve EPA license compliance and improving the standards and and robustness of treatment till 2040 for secondary treatment process. So that, that's a regulatory requirement. So um, there isn't a cost benefit analysis in having to undertake that. It's a, requ it's a regulatory requirement to meet the growth in Warrnambool that this upgrade needs to occur. Um, now the, net, the possibility then is doing cost benefit analyses of further treatment, okay, so such as tertiary treatment analysis. And I'm not sure if that's what Laurie is referring to, and and uh, also um, recycling effluent, so treating it to a higher standard and recycling it and using it um, in a recycled sense on public open spaces or for agricultural purposes. Um, we haven't done recent cost benefit analyses um, on that. We we did a, an investigation back in 2011 around recycling and found no viable alternatives. One of the challenges there is the costs are quite high to turn the sewage, to treat the sewage to a higher quality and turn it inland. And there's um, reasonably ample groundwater, low cost groundwater that exists in the region. So there wasn't the demand for it. So that, that didn't occur, but we've got our, we'll continue to look at that um, and explore that possibility because at a high level, it does make some sense. Okay, so Laurie's, Laurie's qualified the question there. 
in terms of uh, um, full cost benefit analysis in terms of the impact on the community over the next 20 years? Uh, well, there was a economic um, assessment undertaken of this project. And so for the uh, investment in sewerage treatment to en enable growth, and you, this was in one of the videos that it does allow, because it allows the growth of Warrnambool and its businesses, uh, uh, small and big, um, it has quite a significant multiplier effect. So it's it's a great um, and a very strong economic project for the region. Okay. Um, I might just leave that there and look at discharge quality. Um, are there any further concerns? Are there any um, opportunities you see, some options that could help uh, relieve your your worries about discharge quality. Some of the concerns that came through were increase in volume, but not imp no improvement to quality. Microplastics and other solids, effluent not at an acceptable standard, high phosphorus levels, high level of waste discharge, low treatment level, no consideration of emerging pollution pollutants should be class A standard and the current license limits not being adequate. Is there anything um, that you can see that bit could be considered as conditions, um, could be considered as um, uh, operational matters or plant matters that um, could help ease some of those concerns. Um, there's a question there, um, Mark or Chris at 8.40, could you reply to that um, in the, in the Q&A please? Um, and there's a question also for EPA um, about the 300 metre radius and what is the I suppose the rationale for a 300 metre um, radius from the outfall. Oh, thank you, David, you're replying to that one. But there's a suggestion there that there could be some, um, a more appropriate range, I'm assuming that it's a, a broader range that you're referring to, Laurie. Okay, there's a, there's a comment there from John, and that is an opportunity, I suppose, to um, share some information that it would enable a, um, an analysis on jobs. And another question there. Okay, um, and I'll ask, um, and thank you, there's, a, there's an interesting idea um, there as well. I'm going to go on to regulatory approval processes. Thank you, Mark. I was just about to ask if you could respond to that question. Um, so the regulatory and approval process that included lack of trust in one and water slash the EPA, um, poor track record, level of community consultation, management and monitoring of the marine environment, um, environmental risk assessment being absent, ongoing regulation concerns, um, length of time commitment that this is a short term solution, but it could be locked in for a number of years. Um, compliance with the Environment Protection Act and response by the EPA. Are there any additional concerns that you um, have under that theme or any ideas that you have um, that could ease these concerns could make the proposal a little, a little more palatable. Very keen to hear your thoughts about that, or rather read your thoughts, I should say. Um, there, is, there is a comment there at 8.44 um, regarding research on other systems. Could you just clarify that, please, in terms of whether you're talking about um, uh, a better understanding of best practice um, and whether you are also talking about um, 
uh, your knowledge of uh, there's been some suggestions of of checking in with other um, in other LGAs. Is is that what you're referring to there? And have you got ideas about where it is being done better elsewhere? Those suggestions would be very helpful. I'm interested in <laughs> no more out, out for all or Australia. I think we'll all have to stop eating for that to be the case. Um, and finally, I'll just give you another moment um, before we go on to location. It's a little hard to come up with a suggestion when it comes to location, but we'll see how we go. OK. So finally, location. Um, if you, if there's anything more you'd like to say about location um, other than what has already been said, Larry, your your comment there. Do you have a sense of what is a more appropriate range? A question there that you could answer very quickly, Andrew, is who owns the site? You're on, you're on mute. Yep. Yeah, no, um, so uh, One on Water is the committee of management of the site of where the, the treatment tanks are located and also the, the area that's a bit further, where, where the, ex, the expansion, the two extra tanks would go. So that's under One on Water's, um, whilst it's uh, public land or Crown land is a better terminology, one of water is a committee management, so it is responsible for that. It has a responsibility for that land. Okay, and we've we've had a question, and I apology apologies if we've missed it. Um, a, a question at eight forty seven: um, What chemicals are being carted in by industrial trucks, and does this pose a risk to residents? Is that something that can be answered easily? Um, I wonder if Chris, uh, if you're there, whether you could give a, uh, a response to that. Chris, we haven't seen you yet, so I'll I'll pop you on the screen. Yeah, thanks for that, Andrew. Sorry, I just missed that question, Jen. I was uh, uh, talking about another response. Apologies. Yes, no worries. Um, it, it's the question at eight forty-seven. Uh, what chemicals are being carted in by industrial trucks and does this pose a, a risk to residents? Uh, yeah, so as far as I'm aware, we don't have any um, major chemicals coming in that are a significant concern. There's uh, the odd deliveries uh, that come in sort of on a irregular basis, but the majority of our trade waste comes through our sewer network, um, being domestic and from our major industrial customers. Um, so uh, Mark might be able to assist more with what specific chemicals might be there, but as far as I know, there isn't too much. Are you able to assist on Mark with that one? Sorry, Chris, was this about uh, chemicals that are brought into the site? Yeah, correct. Yeah, at, at, the, at the moment, the only chemicals um, other than sort of, you know, cleaning chemicals for, for equipment, um, that the chemicals that are used as part of the process is just uh, polymer, um, which is used as part of the biosolids uh, dewatering process. Yeah, I suppose um, the question is also referring to um, the the transportation of waste from the trucks, but I think you've you've covered that that Chris. So just to clarify that, Jen, the the there's no trucked waste to the site all comes by pipe there is a septage receival facility located at the site so all the properties outside Warrnambool and areas in the countryside that have got septic tanks get them pumped out every three years and um, that, that pumped out waste goes to the septic receival facility so there's no, no there's no nasty chemicals or anything like that it's just um, septage septage yeah thank you all right, we've just got a few minutes left for you to get any last questions in. And thank you, Laurie, for answering that, that question that I put up. Um, any any further comments? So there's I'm, I'm going back up through to see whether there's been uh, missing. I, I'm looking at 842 here. 
Um, people from the new housing estate accessing Shelley Beach and Second Bay for swimming and other recreation. I, I assume that means that they're missing or bypassing signs. I know you talked about signs in your video. Is there anything more that, that can be said about that? Yeah, I think there is, Jen. And um, in our works approval application on page 31, um, there's a picture, uh, you know, a satellite picture showing where our, where the mixing zone actually extends to. Now, it doesn't, doesn't extend to Shelley Beach. Um, it stops before Shelley Beach. I just wanted to clarify that for everybody. That's different to what was in the video. So I'll just refer people to that location. They actually want to see where the mixing zone is. And the um, and the testing results we've had for E. coli um, at the edge of that mixing zone were reported in our video as well. So they're way below uh, our limits. OK, thank you. Um, just so that um, you don't feel that the comments and the work that you did during uh, that um, Engage Victoria time, um, that that sort of went into the ether. It certainly didn't. Um, there were some options that came through and I just thought that I would show that. I've got a, a similar slide uh, for the number of questions that have come through, but I, I, I feel that most of those, um, if not all, have been answered either in the video or tonight. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure you will in the, the Q&A. Um, but yes, there were a number of, of options um, that have already been um, suggested and, and we'll put those into under the appropriate headings um, in my report. And I thought I'd just <laughs> highlight the one at the bottom, um, which um, is a... <laughs> <laughs> An interesting place to leave the um, the session tonight. I'm going to pass back to um, Stephen for some final words. I'll bring up the next steps again um, because that that might be useful to reiterate now that we have gone through that process. Um, before I do that, I'd like to thank everybody for your patience tonight. Um, I think I pressed the odd button incorrectly and, and didn't press audio when I should have a few times, but I do appreciate your, your patience. Um, COVID has required us to do things in a whole lot of different ways. And um, if only the technology could, could keep up with our needs and, and have something a little more streamlined, that would be uh, really useful uh, from my point of view too. But I do appreciate your attendance. Um, two hours at night after a uh, a day of work, probably sitting in front of a screen on meetings for many people um, is a bit of a slog. So thank you. Um, it, uh, it is very much appreciated. Um, from here, I go away and uh, with my colleague Kylie, write a uh, comprehensive report that um, will be posted um, on Engage Victoria after it's been um, considered by the EPA. Um, and in that, as I said earlier, we'll have recommendations for consideration based on what you have told us tonight. So thank you for this tremendous input. Um, it is very much appreciated. I can see that there are already 137, 138 and rising comments um, and questions. Kylie, I think we've got our work cut out for us after here. I'm going to pass back to you, Stephen, um, just to, to finish us off with that last slide. Um, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jen. I guess I'll just uh, reiterate your comments. It's great to see so much participation during the event. Obviously, having to do it in this online forum is not our preferred way of community engagement, but it's the option we've got at the moment. And so it's great that lots of people have been able to contribute their thoughts, you know, even though it was in a, a text format rather than the spoken word that we're normally used to for these kind of events. So thank you to all those who put up with the technology in order to bother contributing like that. that uh, 
gives us lots more information to uh, consider within our assessment and makes it clear what the community's feeling is about the proposal and where we should sort of focus our efforts in terms of our assessment. Um, yeah, so next steps, so we covered this before, obviously, but just to sort of reiterate, I suppose, so tonight, obviously, we're wrapping up the, the community, direct community engagement portion uh, of our information gathering, obviously pending whether we have further submission periods based on asking for further information from the applicant. Um, and so then we'll essentially move into our assess, finalising our assessments phase. So using our internal experts to consider some of the things that have been raised tonight around modelling and such, uh, and making an assessment of all the information that the applicant has provided. And considering you know, the, the risks that are being posed, have they adequately been mitigated by the proposal? Is the proposal best practice, that kind of thing? That then obviously will lead through to the decision and we've spoken about sort of the notifications and where you can find information about that. Just, I guess, another reminder, people on the call probably already know because they've managed to find their way here, but that Engage Vic website is the place to get information on uh, updates on the status of the approval. That, that'll be the place where we update regularly as uh, new information comes to hand or status of the approval process is changing. So please refer there. Uh, yeah, I guess thank you to Jen. Obviously, it's a difficult task. Uh, coordinating the button so well done and thank you Jen and thanks to everyone else for uh, their presentations and being able to, uh, to answer questions on the fly it's a, a difficult job at the best of times and uh, more difficult in this scenario than a live event probably so thank you for everyone for working through that with us we'll leave it there thank you